John, it's an honor to join you here this morning to introduce and welcome Dr. Irwin to the stage. When I joined CHEST, I knew of Dr. Irwin by reputation. He was said to be a perfectionist. Some may use the phrase demanding. And having now had the pleasure of having worked with Dr. Irwin as editor-in-chief of CHEST for the last 13 years, I can also tell you these statements are true. But the demand for rigor in the scope of the journal really comes from the weight of responsibility, of knowing that the clinical research published in CHEST has implications for the practice of medicine across pulmonary, critical care, and sleep. It impacts patients. It impacts people and their lives. Such responsibility requires integrity, and Richard has a high degree of integrity that he holds himself to, as well as everybody around him. In leading the journal, his editorial sensibility has been guided by a patient focus, by understanding the research with the best likelihood of improving their care, but also emphasizing the patient experience through humor and poetry and reminding us what this field is about. Thanks, Nikki. You know, CHEST is more than just a medical journal. CHEST is the face and brand of the American College of CHEST Physicians. Recognition and awareness of the journal as the face of the organization is an incredibly important aspect of what it means to the CHEST organization as a whole. While some of Dr. Irwin's most significant contributions to this organization have been through his years as editor-in-chief, He's also served as CHESS president from 2003 to 2004, obtained his master fellow designation in 2009, spearheaded our work on the cough guidelines, and served in countless leadership positions for the college and the foundation throughout the years. You know, this breadth of experience makes Richard uniquely qualified to present this morning as our opening session speaker. It is our honor to introduce to you and present to you, Dr. Richard Irwin. Good morning. Thank you very much, Nikki and John. As they have said, I am Richard Irwin, and I passionately believe in patient-focused care. And my goal this morning is to have you understand why. The format for my presentation will be my posing and then answering a series of questions, starting with, who is this person who will be speaking to us today about patient-focused care? I'm a pulmonary and critical care medicine specialist, and yes, for those of you who are looking, I am wearing cowboy boots. I got introduced to them in the 1990s during my first visit to San Antonio, and I've been wearing them ever since. Here is a picture of my first pair that I still have and wear. It's goat hide, because that was the only leather that I could afford. The picture documents, especially for you younger folks, that today is not my first San Antonio rodeo and that your boots or shoes or other things will last if you take good care of them. I am currently chair of critical care at UMass Memorial Medical Center and professor of medicine and nursing at the University of Massachusetts in Worcester, Massachusetts. I was born in New London, Connecticut in 1942 as the second child of Harold Irwin, an internist, and Sylvia Irwin, who was working as a social worker. For, again, you younger people in the audience, this slide shows that there was photography in 1942. <laughs> I have an older sister, Bobby. 
I graduated from Tufts College in 1964 and received my medical degree from Tufts Medical School in 1968. I received my residency training in medicine at the Tufts New England Medical Center in Boston and my pulmonary training at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City. I fought in the Vietnam War in Biloxi, Mississippi as a major in the Air Force. While I came into this world as a member of the traditionalist generation, my generational characteristics, I believe, summarized on the next slide, fit best with the baby boomer generation. For this generation, the events that define us are the Civil Rights Movement, the Vietnam War, the Kennedy and King assassinations, the Cold War, the space race, the introduction and coming of age of television, and the women's rights movement. The core values are optimism, team orientation, personal gratification, health and wellness, personal growth, and involvement. The personality traits include being driven, being soul-searching, willing to go the extra mile, and having a love-hate relationship with authority. The communication and work style traits include showing respect, providing anecdotes when giving feedback, preferring face-to-face -face communication, requiring full attention during conversations, and having loyalty to work and institution. Well, having provided you with a sense of who I am, let me turn to my next question. According to the literature, what is known about patient-focused care? It's the care defined from the patient's perspective. Scholarly work has revealed that it embodies the three C's of communication, continuity of care, and concordance of expectations. And that means finding the common ground. Patient-focused care has led to significant improvements in patient outcomes. Patients preferred over physician-centered, technology-based, disease-focused models in which I was trained. I was trained in a model that had the patient as a passive receiver of medical intervention. With these brief introductory remarks, let me turn to my patient-focused care journey. It began when I was approximately seven to eight years old. It was then that I think I first thought about being a doctor and why. I remember that my dad frequently made house calls and on some of them, I would ride with him when it got dark. And in order to find the number of the house in the dark, my dad had the coolest spotlight on the outside of the Buick that he used. And I thought, wow, how cool it would be to use one of those. Also, during those days in the 1940s, if you got sick, it was the custom, at least in my house, based upon no good data, that you got enemas. Because I used to get sick a lot, I had frequent enemas. This led me to believe that to be a doctor, all you needed was a spotlight <laughs> and an enema bag. I remember thinking that giving an enema had to be better than receiving one. <laughs> Even though it's a dark and scary place, not once as a seven-year-old did I think that you needed a spotlight to find the rectum. <laughs> While I summarize what the literature has to say about patient-focused care, what does patient-focused care really mean to me? I believe that it's the care we want our families to receive and all of the time. I don't mean to imply it's the care we only want just for our own families, but everyone's families. So let me provide you with some specific examples that involved my family members, and let me preface these remarks by saying 
that while these examples and pictures were the same ones I used in my presidential address in 2003, I still hear and or observe that these things are continuing to happen. If my wife, Diane, shown here, or your spouse respectfully requests that a staff anesthesiologist rather than a less experienced physician be the one to insert an intravenous catheter prior to surgery, I hope that her wish will be honored. It's also my hope that should Diane forget to bring a referral from her primary care physician for an office visit with a specialist, that the office staff of the specialist will help her get the referral right then and there rather than send her home. If my 92-year-old mother, Sylvia Irwin, shown here, or your mother is 30 minutes late for an appointment in a hospital clinic because there's a long line at the registration desk, I would hope that she would still be seen despite being unavoidably late for her appointment. It's also my hope that when my mom calls her physician, the office phone is answered by a pleasant human being and that her physician returns calls when he or she says that he or she will. If my sister Bobby Pollock, shown here, a 20-year survivor of stage four ovarian cancer, or your sister or brother travels two hours for an appointment and arrives at the doctor's office on the wrong day, I hope that she will be accommodated and seen rather than being sent home because she's cared for by a physician or physician group that practices open access care. Her story has been a special one for me because it taught me that overall statistics of a disease don't always predict what will happen to individual patients. I'm hoping that my brother-in-law, Dr. Norman Pollock, shown here, will never have to see another physician who is so insensitive and preoccupied that he fails to consistently call him by his correct name and fails to put the earpieces of his stethoscope in his ears when listening to Norman's heart. If one of my daughters, Rachel, Jamie, Rebecca, or Sarah, shown here, or one of your daughters are prescribed a new medication, I hope that the physician will ask them about all the other medications they're taking to make sure that there is no potential life-threatening interaction between drugs. Before I leave this slide, I have to tell you, those teeth cost a lot of money. <laughs> I have a feeling many of you have experienced the same. If my son-in-law, Dr. Andrew Coe, shown here, or my other sons-in-law, Andrew McIntosh, or Adam Slater, or your son-in-law, has to undergo general anesthesia and require anticoagulation to prevent blood clots from forming in their legs, I hope that they will be cared for by a physician who practices medicine according to the best available evidence and who embraces the concept of lifelong learning. If my son-in-law, Andrew McIntosh, shown here, or your son-in-law, is ever sick enough to be on life support in an ICU, I hope that they will be cared for by a compassionate physician who believes in interprofessional collaborative care and is knowledgeable about end-of-life issues and the special needs of the family members. If one of my grandsons, Jacob, shown here and now a 10-year survivor of childhood leukemia, or Benjamin, Truman, Bailey, Isaac, Emmett, or Asher, or my next grandson who will be born in January, or my granddaughter, we finally got one, Laurel, or one of your grandchildren has to be admitted to a hospital. I hope that the hospital has an active and continuous quality improvement program to ensure that the care they receive has the best chance of being of the highest quality and safe. Well, why have I defined patient-focused care in terms of family, mine, and yours? For multiple reasons. We should always 
with the rare exception, when you hate your family, want the best for our families. It is defined in terms to which all physicians can relate. The definition of family, according to Webster's Dictionary, extends to the human race. And if we don't know how to provide patient-focused care in a certain situation, I recommend that physicians should ask themselves, what would I want another healthcare provider to do for my mother or father or wife or husband, children or grandchildren? The answer often will be the patient-focused care thing to do. Who made me aware of what patient-focused care is really about? Was it my teachers in medicine? Was it my dad, Dr. Harold Irwin? I can easily answer these questions. My formative years as a physician took place in a work schedule environment that involved being on call every other night and every other weekend for two consecutive years. Moreover, during the epidemic of the Hong Kong flu in 1968, I was on and barely awake for three straight days because many of my fellow interns came down with the flu. Because I always seemed to be in survival mode during my internship and residency, I didn't learn to practice patient-focused care during my training. Therefore, it wasn't my teachers in medicine who taught me what patient-focused care is all about. While I subsequently learned that my dad did practice patient-focused care, I never saw it because I was too kid-focused. I have lots of memories of going into our backyard on weekends to play catch with my dad and always having the activity interrupted by a patient phone call and his having to leave to take care of them. It made sense. He was in solo practice and was always on call. Therefore, I didn't learn to practice patient-focused care from my dad. So who and what opened my eyes to what patient-focused care is really all about? While my wife, Diane, an ICU nurse, made me realize that nurses provided a much needed different approach in caring for patients, it was my mom. And she was the one who opened my eyes and it related to the sudden death of my father in 1981. That was 13 years after I graduated from medical school. My dad died from a massive stroke while visiting us in Massachusetts from Florida. A few months later, upon returning to Florida, my mom called my dad's primary care physician and cardiologist and left messages that my dad had died. Weeks passed. When my dad's physicians in their offices never called or sent a sympathy card acknowledging my father's passing, my mom was furious because she was left with the impression that my dad didn't mean anything to them. This opened my eyes to the realization of how much patients have emotionally invested in their physicians and that I should reciprocate in kind. My mom always shared with me some wise patient-related advice when I told her stories that taught me some valuable lessons. Let me share with you three particularly memorable stories upon which she commented. The first one started when I was 15 years old. I was in New London, Connecticut, hitchhiking, hitchhiking to Ocean Beach. An elderly woman picked me up. I sat in the back seat. We drove a block to a stop sign. She turned around and looked at me and she said, are you French? And I said, no. We went another block. She stopped at a stop sign. She turned around and she said, are you Italian? And I said, no. She pulled over to the curb. She turned around, looked at me. She was full face and she said, well, what are you? And I said, I'm Jewish. Get out. 
So I got out of the car, I hitchhiked some more, I got a ride to the beach. Thirty years later, I get off the plane in LaGuardia, New York, for those of you who are unaware of the state of New York, got into a cab and I was going to give a talk at Montefiore Hospital. Got into the wrong cab, the gentleman immediately screeches away from the curb. He's obviously on some kind of drug. Seemed to be going the back roads, we got off the highway. Took corners on two wheels, I think we were going 40 to 50 miles an hour around corners. And he's jumping around in the seat, playing with the wheel, and he turns around and he says, you Hispanic? <laughs> and I said, see. Sí. <laughs> so when I told my mother this story, she said to me, so what did you learn? And I said, don't make the same mistake twice. <laughs> she said, I agree with you. It's okay to lie when your life is on the line, <laughs> but never lie to the patients. The second story relates to how I met my wife. I met my wife under a bed in an ICU. I was an intern. In those days, if your ward patient actually became critically ill, they ended up in the ICU. So there wasn't a separate ICU rotation, at least the Tufts and Wingham Medical Center during those times. And I was picking up Betty, who was anuric. She's had subacute glomerulonephritis. She was on peritoneal dialysis. And as I approached Betty's bed, I noticed that there was a nurse on her hands and knees. This was the day of short skirts. Diane's head was down trying to figure out why the dialysis fluid wasn't coming out faster than it was. I immediately said, I have to see what the other end looks like. <laughs> so in those days, we were dressed all in white, starched. I could barely bend, but I managed to actually get on the floor and I crawled under the bed and I came face to face with Diane. She jumped back. I had no idea what to say, but what I ended up coughing out was, I think I wanna have children with you. <laughs> Don't do this at home. She didn't speak to me for months, um, but finally, um, I lucked out and she decided that she would go out with me and then we got married. So I told my mother the story and she said, you never know when opportunity will knock. She also told me that she was pleased that I married a nurse because Diane the nurse would teach me to become a more caring doctor. The last story that I'd like to share with you um, was actually during a trip to Singapore. There were, in the presidential line, four of us. There was Udaya Prakash, there was Sid Brayman, there was myself and Paul Qualley. We all gave talks. I managed to be the last person to speak. And there was there were questions from the audience after each of us spoke. The moderator said, are there any questions for Professor Irwin? There was a hand in the back, shot up, the gentleman jumps up, he's called on, and he gets the microphone and he addresses me. He says, Professor Irwin, we have heard many speakers from the West. You are the shortest. <laughs> My mother said to me, well, what did you learn from that? 
And I said, don't take yourself too seriously, to which she said, good boy. <laughs> I also learned that it's important to have members of our team all share the same passion of providing patient-focused care. So here are two such members of our team, actually also possessing nice teeth. Carrie Krikorian on the left, a clinical nurse specialist, and Cindy French on the right, who was a clinical nurse specialist, who became a nurse practitioner, who became an independent researcher after obtaining her PhD. Together, I don't believe Carrie, Cindy, or I ever failed to let patients and their families know how important they are or were to us. And I don't believe that as a team, we have ever missed going to the calling hours and or funeral of one of our long-term patients who passed away. In this regard, I'd like to share two more memorable stories that actually took place during calling hours. The first one related to the passing of Doris, and the second to the passing of Eleanor. With respect to Doris, I think as a team we took care of her for about 20 years. It had become my custom when traveling distances to let patients know that I'm thinking about them, to bring them back little gifts. And I especially wanted to do that when I knew that the patients were getting near the end of their lives. During a trip to Turkey and then visiting Ankara and the museum there, I bought a little oriental rug that I gave to Doris when I returned. She was deeply touched. She loved the rug. And about six months later, Doris passed away. As Cindy and I were approaching the open casket at the calling hours, we noticed that the oriental rug was laying across Doris's chest. And on top of that were two Almond Joy candy bars. I don't think she loved anything to eat more than the Almond Joy candy bars, and it became clear to me that her most precious possession turned out to be the oriental rug that I gave her. About three months later, Doris's oldest daughter came to clinic. She brought some baked goods that she had made for the staff and for me. And she and I spoke in the corridor of the clinic for just a few minutes. She said to me, you know, Dr. Irwin, I need to tell you we didn't bury the oriental rug with mom. There were four daughters, and I'm the oldest, and I got to pick first of whatever Doris had for possessions, and I picked the most meaningful one. The second story relates to Eleanor. This was probably about maybe 15 to 20 years ago, Eleanor passed away. During those days when patients actually seemingly just had a respiratory problem, they asked me if I would be their primary care physician, and I was. And then, because Eleanor was so dear to us, I took care of her husband, I took care of the daughter, and I took care of the son. When Eleanor passed away, I remember approaching the casket with Carrie, Cindy came a little bit later, but she can confirm that Carrie will tell you that what I'm about to tell you is a true story. As we approach the casket to give our last respects to Eleanor, the daughter came up to me with a camera, and she said, my mother loved you to pieces, we all do, so that we can remember the relationship that you and my mother had could you please get into the casket so I can take your picture? <laughs> the 
there are three C's embodied within patient-focused care. Communication, continuity of care, and concordance of wishes. Finding the common ground. I was not going to get into the casket. <laughs> the common ground for me was to get my head as close to Eleanor's as possible, but outside of the casket, <laughs> and allow Eleanor's daughter to take our picture. And that was finding the common ground. She was less happy with that, but it still made her happy. Well, why is it so very important for me to take a broader view of the definition of family? It's because of Betty Beckman, shown on this slide with her husband, Darold, who I remembered as Betty Jones, my fifth grade teacher. She was the first person outside of my home who made me feel good about myself. I reconnected with Betty when she sent me a letter in 1997. The letter read, I don't know if you're the Richard Irwin I'm looking for, because my husband found three Richard S. Irwins in a telephone directory of 88 million Americans. I decided to send this letter to you because your father was a doctor, you were born and raised in New England, you told me in the fifth grade that you were going to be a doctor, and you were the only Richard S. Irwin of the three who was living in New England. If you're my fifth grade student, please call me at the number I'm providing because I want to return your Hebrew school workbook that you gave me. <laughs> she did give it back to me. I was very proud of the work that I did in this workbook, and there is no question that I had a crush on Betty. Through the generosity of the chess organization, I was able to invite Betty and Daryl to join my family as my guests at the annual meeting of the college when I became inducted as the president for 2003-2004. It was quite a memorable event for Betty and I because it was the first time in 50 years that Betty and I had last seen each other. How do we get physicians to embrace and practice patient-focused care? This is a task for all stakeholders, but especially for me and you and medical societies. In my case, as is often the case, it took a family healthcare calamitous event to open my eyes to what patient-focused care is really about. While medical schools are now incorporating experiential learning and simulation centers and using standardized patients so that medical students and all trainees can be introduced to the concept in their formative years, it's important to remember that the hidden curriculum is always in play. This means that we must always realize and remember that others are watching us and how we act. And if we're not careful, impressionable ones can learn bad behavior from us. That's the hidden curriculum. Additionally, patients and family members also have a big role to play. You need to become informed about best practices and patient-focused care standards and let physicians know when your needs and expectations are not being met because our medical society was willing to also play a role. The CHEST organization in 2003 decided to join the patient-focused care revolution. It was at the convocation ceremony that year, shown here, that the patient-focused care pledge was first recited by all who were in attendance. The format as you no doubt saw, is obviously different than what we're doing now. While we've already read this pledge aloud this morning, I'd like to explain why we chose 
the terms and words that are highlighted on this slide. The term patient focus was chosen over the Institute of Medicine's patient-centered term because it felt more decisive and action-oriented, and I believe it still does. Compassion was chosen over sympathy and empathy because the word compassion, most people don't appreciate this, not only embodies being sympathetic, but also imparts that there's a desire on the part of the provider to do whatever can be done to ease the situation. If you want providing care according to the best available evidence, you want giving patients what they deserve. And if you want providing interdisciplinary or interprofessional care, you want tapping into the group intelligence that distinguishes the best teams. If you want monitoring the outcomes of your patients and your practice, you can't be certain that you're providing the best care possible. Because the standards of care change, as healthcare providers, we must continue to study and learn. If I provided care today the way I did in 1968, no patient in their right mind would want me to care for them. Lastly, because none of us is perfect or works in a perfect system, we must always be looking at our monitored data to strive to do better. To do this, we must embrace continuous quality improvement. I'd like to leave you with two pieces of advice. The first comes from a Jewish proverb. The days are like the pages of a book. Think and think often about how you want things to be remembered. If you want to be thought of as a patient-focused care provider, you need to constantly work at it each and every day. In this regard, if you don't know how to provide patient-focused care in a certain situation, as I have previously said, ask yourself, what would I want another healthcare provider to do for my mother or father or wife or children? or grandchildren? The answer has a really good chance of being the patient-focused care thing to do. Lastly, because none of us is perfect and all of us can have a bad day, understand how to apologize in a cleansing and healing way. Such an apology is composed of four parts. Acknowledge the offense, explain why it happened, do so by showing remorse and sincerity, and lastly, make an attempt at reciting a reparation. By that I mean by offering what you're going to do to make up for it, or what you're going to do to minimize it ever happening again. Because it's so important to apologize the right way, I encourage everyone to read the book on apology by Aaron Lazar, who had been the chancellor at our medical school. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.